morning. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you very much, Kent. You know, I don't know much. I'll make that confession right now. What I do know, however, is that you never know. Now you're always sitting there going, what's this guy talking about? You never know. You never know how fate, circumstance, the power of the universe is going to dictate your life and how you will impact the lives of others through all of those confluence of events. If you had said to me 10 years ago that I would be in the horse business, the horse racing business, doing anything in the equine area, I would have told you, well, I don't think that's exactly a realistic situation. But I am. And I have to take you back. I'm going to take you back to a story of entrepreneurialism and entrepreneurship. Roughly 30 years ago, when I was in school, talk about circumstance, I was working with a hockey team out of Hartford, Connecticut, and I worked for a fellow there named Bill. And Bill had a son named Scott. Scott and I became good friends, played hockey together, same age. And one day he says to me, he says, you know, Dad and I are going to be doing this thing in TV. Oh, really? I said, yeah. So we're going to start a TV station. I said, okay. You know? But we're going to distribute it on this thing called cable. I go, what's that? He goes, well, you use this cable to send TV signals, and you get better pictures than you get over the air. Okay, that's good. What are you going to do? He said, well, we're going to put sports on at night, and then during the day we're going to do, like, I Love Lucy and Leave it to Beaver and Bonanza and all of those people my generation know what that is, know those shows. And we're going to put that on during the day, and then at night we're going to do University of Connecticut sports. Oh, okay, that sounds interesting. How are you going to do this? He said, well, you know, we're going to distribute it with the cable systems. I said, cable systems? What's that? So he explained it to me some more. So I said, well, okay. He said, you know, and we'd like you to come work for us when we get this thing going. Okay, sounds cool. I was about to graduate from college, or I was in my... My uh, senior year of college, this is kind of like the fall of 1978. Now you can do your math and figure out how old I am. And when we got there, we, we, uh, he said to me, he said, I said, well, how you, when are you going to start this? He said, well, probably next year. I said, okay, that's good. So what ended up happening was that Bill and Scott had no money, and, but they had an idea. And they pulled together the all of the cable operators in the state of Connecticut rented for $20 a conference room and proceeded to present this idea to the cable operators in Connecticut and said that they were going to microwave the signal around the state, which back in those days was a point-to-point -point communication situation, video situation. And at the end of the meeting, there was some skepticism because cable back in those days was nothing more than the, the uh, retransmission of broadcast signals. So an older gentleman named Paul Hancock, wonderful man who's since passed on, came up to Bill and he said, you know, I listened to this and it's pretty interesting, but you've got to check out this thing called the satellite. Bill goes, what the heck is the satellite? And he said, well, it's up in the sky. And I understand because there's this thing called home box office that is going to, that is using it, and you, it's a little bit more efficient than your idea about microwaving. So he said, well, who do I call? He said, well, you call the guys at RCA. So he calls the guys at RCA. Guy comes up and sits and talks to him. And he says, you know, if you do this, you can transmit your signal all over the United States. Bill goes, Really? Yeah. He said, you mean like in Washington? In California? He goes, yeah. And he says, not only that, you can go to Mexico and Canada, too. And Bill goes, oh, well, I'll take one then. So what do you mean you'll take one? I want one. You tell me that I want it. He said, well, you know, do you have the money? We said, well, we'll worry about that later. So now... His original business idea has sort of gone out the window, right? Because who in Colorado is going to be interested in the University of Connecticut athletics? Probably not many people back in those days. 
So now you've got to fast forward the film to August of 1978, and Bill and Scott are on their way to New Jersey from Connecticut. And this is back when not every car had air conditioning, so it's hot, humid, and they're in a traffic jam because there's construction, and they're sitting there, and Bill's being Bill, and he's going, you know, what are we going to do? How are we going to do this? You know, and Scott's driving, and he's going kind of nuts, and Scotty finally says, I don't care. Put football games on all day. Bill goes, that's it. Scott goes, what do you mean, that's it? He says, we'll do this thing all sports. Scott goes, all sports? He says, yeah, we'll put football games on all day. All sports, all the time, 24 hours. He goes, well, how are we going to do that? He said, well, let's talk about it. So Scott being a whiz with numbers, they switched cars. They switched, he got in the passenger seat, Bill got in the, in the driver's seat. And they developed what today is ESPN, right there, in the car. And the story goes on, and it essentially goes on to, to the fact that they didn't have any money, but they had this idea, and so how are we going to get the money, and who are we going to do it with, and you know, all of those various business decisions that all of you entrepreneurs out there fully understand what I'm talking about. Like, where's our next nickel going to come from? And they got in, involved in an investment company in Philadelphia, investment house in Philadelphia, who agreed to sort of give them, you know, bridge money while they could sort of get their idea going. They had the idea to go to the NCAA because back in those days, the NCAA really only had product on, on, on Saturday afternoons on ABC or NBC or CBS. Those were the out outlets. And so they figured that they could put a lot of content with the NCAA. So the NCAA got sort of interested in this. And then there was an investor who got kind of interested in this. And every entrepreneur out there knows that to be successful, you have to have a confluence of events, right? You have to have opportunity. You have to have some luck. And you have to absolutely be in the right place at the right time and the exact timing for everything to kind of work. What ended up happening next was Bill is at the NCAA headquarters in Shawnee Mission, Kansas, meeting with Walter Byers, who back in those days was the executive in charge of the NCAA. And the assistant walked in and said, uh, Mr. Uh, Rasmussen, he says, you have a call from a Mr. Stu Evie at the Getty Oil Company. And Getty Oil was the first funder of ESPN, which today is a $6 billion enterprise, probably one of the most recognized brands, in, certainly in the sports world and maybe in the world. Um, it has, uh, has absolutely 100% changed and built an entire industry, that being the sports industry. And that is as good an example of entrepreneurialism as I can explain in, in this short pe time period that, that we have. With the good, and has it been good? And those of us who work there, we will sit and, and talk about this periodically, you know, has it been good? I was talking with a fellow who works with me now. He and I both worked at ESPN together. He stayed longer than I did. And we sit there and we go, yeah, it's been great because it created this great industry, right? College basketball, so big here in Kentucky, which everybody is well aware of. You know, college basketball was in, in part built by ESPN, and it built this entire industry, the apparel industry, and it's brought tremendous amounts of money into the sports world and into being an athlete. That's the good. Here's the bad. The bad is that it has completely changed the society and the role of sports in the society for our children and for your children. Because in part of the money, okay? Right? So now, instead of going out and playing in the backyard, everything's organized by adults. And we got super travel teams. And we got the double A and the single A and the triple A and all these travel teams. And we got to play 12 months out of the year. I didn't, never played sports 12 months out of the year. I played football in the fall, I played hockey in the winter, and I played baseball in the spring, and I took the summer off. But the money 
has put the adults into the mix. And when the adults get into the mix in an area that should be geared for children, it kind of screws up the educational process for the children. And what I'm talking about here, if I could philosophize for a minute, is that kids learn, talk about the education video that we saw, kids learn by doing, and kids learn by being active in the process of doing, not having the process done for them. So when you're in the backyard, and it's, a, and it's a game organized by kids to play baseball in the backyard, we'll just use baseball for a minute, it involves the skill of leadership. Somebody's got to take charge. Somebody's got to call all the kids. Let's arrange the game, right? So they've got to sell. They've got to, you know, because Joey, he doesn't want to play baseball today. He wants to sit home and watch television or in these, this day, play Nintendo, right? So you got to look at it from that perspective. So he's got to sell. Then they got to come to the, to the field. they got to decide where they're going to play. They then have to turn around, and they have to decide the rules and the teams. Who's going to be on the team? So they have to decide the team. Then we have this little thing that we all know in business called conflict resolution. Right? You're out. No, I'm not. I'm safe. No, you're out. No, I'm safe. Well, how do we dissolve, resolve the conflict? If you have an adult solving the conflict, the kid doesn't learn how to solve the conflict. Or the kids don't learn how to solve the conflict. And then they have to set up the rules. And that is all an outgrowth of the money that's come into sports by virtue of ESPN. That is the bad, in my viewpoint. If I could philosophize again for a second. Oops. So it's a very interesting problem in society because I've seen it. I've been very involved in kids' athletics. And I don't know how it gets fixed. I don't know if it gets fixed. And then you have that little thing called the Sports Center Generation where everybody does things so that they can get on Sports Center. I just saw a clip not too long ago of this kid who's a nine year old playing hockey, I believe it was in Maine. And he comes down the ice and he does all this fancy stuff. He's got the stick going, the puck going, <whistles> fires it in the net. I can tell you 25 years ago, 30 years ago, that never would have happened. But he knew by doing it, he could get on to Sports Center. An outgrowth of ESPN. So now, with all this technology that's going, I'll transfer into the, into the, uh, the horse business for, uh, for a minute. I left ESPN, went off and did some stuff. I, I've been a, uh, a pioneer. I like to call myself a pioneer in the world of television, the world of sports. And no idea in my mind is a bad idea. It's just how do we implement that idea. And it's a very interesting kind of confluence of events, as I said a minute ago, that put me into this situation in the horse business because I knew nothing about horse racing. Absolutely nothing. Matter of fact, I said to some folks today, if you would put a thoroughbred and a donkey in front of me when we started, I would have been hard pressed to tell you the difference. Okay? But what I did realize by not being in it very long, and I'm a sports guy, is that this is a really cool sport. And this is a really cool sport that a lot of people don't know about. And how do we use the power of television? Because remember, I've seen television build an entire industry. So how do we use the power of television and the power of all of the world's communications to take this sport, which in 1950 was the third most popular sport in the country, how do we take it and elevate it back into its place? Because it is a perfect sport for today's instantaneous society, right? It's a two-minute event. Golf tournaments, four days. <laughs> Baseball game now, four or five hours, who knows, right? So it's a two-minute event. So how do we use all of this technology, mobile, the internet, you know, the, com the internet, the computer, the television, how do we use that to elevate the sport? And then something tragic happened at the Preakness two years ago. We had the situation with Barbaro. And that outpouring of support and love and that emotional connection between America and the horse. 
And if you'll pardon my expression, I was like, holy shit! This is unbelievable. I remember vividly saying that to myself. This is unbelievable. So how do we capitalize on that? Using technology. How do we use the technology, the emotional connection between America and the horse to develop a television network or a content distribution platform, or use those platforms to develop content that educates America about the horse and the sport of horse racing. And that's what we're trying to do. And it ain't easy, but you know what? Nothing worthwhile is ever easy. And I will leave you with the following thoughts of, remember, I don't know much, but I do know that if you have a passion and you have a belief in that passion and you focus all of your energy towards moving that passion forward in whichever way you want to move it, you will succeed. If you have two things, the belief that you will succeed. Bill Rasmussen had the belief he would succeed in building ESPN. And he did. And you don't let anybody tell you that it's a bad idea. Because I can tell you firsthand that people told him, you're crazy. That'll never work. 24 hours a day, sports will never work. And we see the outgrowth of it moving forward. I appreciate your time. I appreciate your patience in listening to me. I wish you all success in all of your future endeavors, and thank you.